Videos from Madison Plus UX made possible by Adorable IO. So this is actually really well scheduled. This talk, kind of the underlying theme here is that our intuition about what we think is going to make our users happy is usually wrong. And so this is about some stories about how we learn that the hard way. So I work at Etsy. Um, I used to be out on the East Coast for a while. I'm back living in Madison now, working remote. So it's cool to see all you people here. Normally I just work out of my home office. It's nice to get out and about. So Etsy is actually not too different. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but from what's going on up at the square right now, you know, the art fair in the square, Etsy is that online. You know, you've got people all over the world buying and selling unique goods. We've got just crossed a million sellers, so there's an awful lot of people. And because of that, all that traffic, we really like to run A-B tests because anything we change on the site can make a really big difference and we can't go ask a million people. We can ask a couple of them, but sometimes we're making changes and we just need to make sure that, you know, some, like there's two different ways we use A-B tests. We can use them to see like, oh, is this thing we did making the site better? But also, is this thing we did making the site worse? Maybe we're switching the databases, we're gonna read from a different database and we just wanna make sure things stay even. I'm not gonna talk too much about that today. I'm gonna talk about the actual product changes and how we make sure that we're actually doing things our users like. And so this talk is really, I'm kind of considering this A-B testing 201. I want to take through some uh, lessons that we uh, learned from doing this, but just for case a couple of you haven't got there, I'm going to run through a quick 101. We'll try to do it in like two minutes and then uh, go from there. So the basic concept here, A-B testing, is you have a theory, you have something that you think is going to make your product better, and you're going to show it to some random visitors. So here my theory is, there's an Etsy listing page. You can buy this pineapple wallpaper. Um, and over there, we're, maybe we'll move the Add to Cart button up to the top. You can see the green button went up. Maybe that's our theory. We'll move the button higher up on the page. We'll get more people pushing it. We'll get more people buying stuff. Let's run an experiment. And the, the term we use is bucketing. So we're going to bucket some people into our experiment. Let's say 10% of the visitors who come to our site. We're going to show them that instead of this. We're going to run it for a while. We're going to see which one does better. And what's interesting about this is not just the simple case here. I mean, we can see if people push the button more. That's easy. But then on top of that, we can also test our implementation. And you're going to see some stories about this later. But maybe we had a bug there, and it just didn't work. So in the experiment, we're going to see nobody buy anything. Like, oh, well, that's not good. Like, obviously, people should have bought something. So you, know, you can go back and you can try your implementation. And also, you can test complex interactions. So in this case, it's probably hard to see. It's a little bit small here. But um, there's a size choice for this listing. So you can choose like medium, small, large, or something like that. And so maybe a complex interaction this would test is if we put the Add to Cart button above that drop down where they pick a size, maybe more people push the Add to Cart button than get an error that they didn't pick a size. And then that causes them to actually buy less because they get frustrated and they leave. So it, the world is this complex place. And maybe the person who had this theory about moving the cart button forgot that we had this other feature on our site because not every listing has it. And doing a test like this would really you know, let you know that there's these interactions that you didn't think about. All right, so that's 101. All right, we decided this is a great idea. We're going to do it. What can possibly go wrong? Because, of course, the devil is in the details. And um, I'm going to tell a bunch of stories. And it's not really going to be me just like popping a bottle and spraying champagne everywhere. Like, th those wouldn't be very interesting stories. So they're mostly going to be ones that went wrong. But the interesting part about them going wrong is that they usually stopped us from making a far worse mistake by us testing it first instead of just you know shipping it and then everybody being pretty angry and sales going down and whatnot. So I'm going to start with the number one no-no that I think is really tempting for a couple of reasons, and that is to do the A then B test. And this is, OK, well, we don't want to deal with all this A-B testing stuff. Let's just run, the run this uh, button at the bottom for a week, and then next week we'll put the button at the top for a week, and we'll see which week we had more sales. I call that the A then B test. I don't know what the real name for it is. but it's really, really tempting to do this because you don't need to build any infrastructure. You don't need to build this bucketing stuff. You don't need to put users in two different groups. You don't need anything. You just deploy this, change it, deploy that, look at your analytics. Did anything change? But like, this just doesn't work. Maybe you, someone in the marketing department ran an AdWords campaign the second week and you have way more sales. Or maybe it's the World Cup and no one's buying stuff on your website. Or like, you know, there's all of these things you can't control. And so by doing one experiment, or by doing it in parallel, or not in parallel, you're losing your chance to actually compare apples to apples. And so if, if you're going to do this, you might as well just launch it and don't even look at your metrics. If you're just like, well, I want to do it, OK, do it. But like, don't try to trick yourself into thinking you're doing A-B testing, because you're not. So once you've decided that, OK, we're going to do this the right way, you've got to build some tooling. You need two pieces of infrastructure. You need one way to bucket people. 
So you need a way to say, oh, you're an experiment, and you're in control. And you need a way to analyze that data. And at Etsy, we have both those tools, and we've open sourced one of the two. So we have a th thing called Feature, which is a PHP library that allows you to split users into groups, and then it uses cookies to make sure they stay in those groups and don't get shuffled around. You know, so if they keep refreshing the page, they see the same treatment, one or the other. Then we have another feature called Catapult, which is actually a proprietary thing we have. It's kind of hard for us to open source because it's really tightly wound into a bunch of other things. But that's our data analytics stack. So I swear this is the only code in the presentation. It's just to show you how simple this is. So if you're using PHP and you need something to do this, this is something you can look at. So we have even our project manager set this up. You have a configuration in your server. You say, here's our new experiment, listing buy button up top. That's our experiment. And we have an array over there. We say it's enabled to 25%. So 25% of people on our site are going to see this experiment. And then in the code, you can just say, is feature enabled, listing buy button up top, do the experiment, otherwise do the control. So it's dead simple. You can throw A-B testing your code just like that. Um, we're pretty happy with it. But now the flip side is, um, there's a GitHub link down here. I'll t uh, tweet this slides out later if you want the links, um, at Corey Luce. But um, so we're pretty happy with this. There's like a million different ways you can do it. Um, you, know, you can go Google for A-B testing stuff, and you, I'm sure you can find a whole bunch of things and compare them. We're happy with this. It works for us. And this is our back end. This is Catapult. So this is what we see in our back end tooling after we've run an experiment. This um, is automatically processed for us by a couple data analytics tools we have. And you can see we ran this experiment 50-50, control versus uh, experiment. And the visit add to cart rate was down 3%. Pages per visit were up half a percent. So something this experiment was kind of weird. People were viewing more pages, but they weren't buying anything. So you know you got to kind of make up some narrative to yourself for why that happened. I actually don't know what experiment this was. I just grabbed a screenshot. And then one important thing to point out here is that it says not enough data for the conversion rate. And so what that means is we didn't run this experiment long enough for our tooling to decide whether or not we actually changed conversion. And the, the example I like to give for this is if I give you a coin, how many times do you need to flip it before you convinced it's rigged? Like if I give you a penny, you flip it three times, you get three heads. You're like, this coin's rigged. Give me a different one. You, know, you just got heads three times in a row. But if you got heads 50 times in a row, maybe you're going to be like, all right, something's up with this penny. So that's what's happening here. The conversion rate says not enough data. And the trick here is, it's science. I liked your science slide better, but this is kind of fun, too. You can buy this shirt on Etsy if you want to. It's the link. But um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit sobering to think, but you have to have a fair amount of traffic to do this. Because if five people come to the site, see the experiment versus control, and three of them buy something, that doesn't mean anything, right? You just got heads three times in a row on your coin. So you need a whole bunch of data before you can actually say, we statistically significantly made a change to this thing. And we have a tool for this. It's actually, you can go find it. If you go to experimentcalculator.com, it's a little bit cut off there. It's a tool that an Etsy alumni sent out. Just a really dead simple website. You say, how many visits do you have per day to the feature you're going to change? What percentage of people are going to see it? So in this example, we have 100,000 people visiting our feature. We're going to go 50-50 with our experiment. Our current conversion rate is 4%, and we think we're going to make it 5% with our experiment. We're going to bump it up one. And then there's the sobering number. You've got to run this experiment for 76 days, which is like, oof, like 100,000 visits a day, and you still got to run for 76 days. So it's a little tough to really pull this off. You need a lot of traffic, or you need to make a big change. And in this case, the reason it thinks it's going to take 76 days is the 1% because we're just making this little minute thing. So if you have a lower traffic site and you want to do some A-B tests, you need to shoot big. So like if I'm going to show another slide here, and the only thing I'm changing is that 1% is going to 5%. So now if we think we're going to make a 5% conversion change with those same numbers, we only have to run the experiment for four days to get real data. So just that little bit. So it's like, if you're, and this is why if you're going to do some experiment like, oh, we're just going to change this button from blue to red, we're going to think it's going to change conversion 0.25%. Well, you're going to have to run that all year. So the lower traffic your site is, the, the higher you got to shoot with your tests. And back to my science slide. So this is science in that you have to have a hypothesis going in. You can't just say, like, oh, we found this new chemical. Let's get some people in here, pump it into them, see what happens. Like, you, <laughs> you have to be like, we think we're going to change conversion. We think we're going to change time on site. We think we're going to change, like, the thing is you can't fish. You have to have this hypothesis going in, and you have to watch those metrics. And... Yeah, that's about there all this too. So let's get into some more interesting failures here. I'm going to walk you through a bunch of things we did wrong. It should be funny. So um, there's really two types of failures that I'm, I'm going to classify these into. 
Um, there's the first type that we're going to talk about here. I've got a couple stories is misrepresentation failures. And these are more mechanical failures. These are things that actually went wrong with our running of the tests that caused errors. Um, we'll get into some of uh, the other type later. So this is the first one. And this is, I think, the easiest one to explain. And a lot of other ones are variations on this. It's uneven bucketing. So we had an experiment that only was eligible to Australian visitors. Turns out they have different seasons than us. And like, we had winter coats on our homepage. And that didn't do them any good. So we had this experiment. We were going to try to like, show them summer stuff when it was summer there. But we ran the experiment on the whole global population that comes to Etsy. So obviously, this graph isn't quite right here. What it should be is like little speckles of blue and red all over the place. right? But the fact is, we showed 50% of our visitors the new Australian homepage and 50% not. But the thing is, the code was correct in that it only worked for Australian visitors. So what we really were doing was this. We were showing 99 point whatever percent of the globe the control, and we were showing half of Australia the experiment. So when we went to analyze the results, it looks like we didn't change anything, even though what we did actually change the Australian user's behavior considerably. Like it was actually a very successful experiment. But in the numbers, it looked like it was really poor. But that's because we were washing out the effect we did have by sh thinking we were showing the experiment to a bunch of other people. We thought we were showing the experiment to all these people, but only those people were eligible. So then these numbers get all diluted, and we think we actually weren't accomplishing anything. So what we needed to do was this. We needed to just only bucket people from Australia and say 50-50. So you have to figure out who's eligible for your experiment and then only run it on those people. And so certain things, like if you're changing your global navigation, sure, it's eligible for everybody. But in this case, only the Australians should have been involved. And so page weight causing event loss. This is actually another similar story that caused our results to be skewed in a way that like, we did not expect. And just from, uh, so the, what caused it was we had an experiment that was much heavier than the control. So just uh, simple, this is simplifying the story a little bit, but the control group had one image on the page, and the experiment group had like six images on the page. So it took way longer to load, it was way slower. And you could have expected that to just, the, the numbers to be poor in the first place, right? Because speed is sort of a feature and maybe people just, wouldn't be as into the site if it was loading slower. So, but it got even worse because the way a lot of these tools work and ours works this way is we use Ajax requests to record the event log. So we load up the page and on page load, we have the browser send a log to our AB server to say like, this person saw the control, this person saw the experiment, and here's some information about them. And so, this is a loading of the page here. You can see um, loaded a listing page. That's how it took about a second to load. Then on page load, there's that blue line. And then these two other pieces of data over there are us sending off the AB metrics. Um, we send off two for silly reason. But the chance to lose event is there, which means is that if anybody clicks back really quick, clicks a different link, closes their browser, those other events never get sent. And this is particularly bad on mobile, where Instead of taking a second to load this page, it might take six seconds, it might take eight seconds, because it's really slow. So what was happening is our experiment, this chance to lose event was way bigger in our experiment, because the page was heavier, and it happened to be a mobile experiment. So we had a lot of mobile visitors seeing it. It was loading really, really slow. And then, well, the experiment was loading way slower than the control, so people were losing the events more often. So just like with the Australia example, in the end, our data looked like we only had like the, the, we were, we were overrepresenting the control group in the data because the experiment's data was getting lost due to this gap because the thing was way slower. So really the lesson to learn from this is, again, it's a comparing apples to apples thing. You have, a, like if you have a page that's two megabytes and you're testing it against a page that's 100K, not only are, it's probably gonna do worse just because it's slower, but maybe if it's awesome, it wouldn't have, but you're gonna have some trouble actually doing this. So we had to go through and like sort of prune some of the control data to get us back to a 50-50 number to compare. Ooh, okay, this is a fun one. We shipped this. This was an experiment. We showed our users this. Um, surprisingly, they didn't buy anything. Um, this is the checkout, but you can't even see the button to buy the thing. But um, so we don't support Internet Explorer 7. And this is a screenshot from IE7. So we get like half a percent of our traffic from IE7, and we just decided it's not worth it to us to test in it and whatever. But turns out we ran an experiment that looked like this in IE7. And so we thought the experiment was going to be great. We had all these like, hopes that like, 
we're, conversion was going to go way up. We were super excited about it. And then the numbers were actually way down when we went to analyze it. But so someone didn't believe that was true. Like they're like, oh, this experiment was, I knew it was going to be awesome. Like the numbers shouldn't be down. So they went and sliced the, um, the data by browser. And they were looking at, OK, in the control group and the experiment group, like how did people do by browser? And it turned out that IE7 had a 0% conversion rate in the experiment. And this is why. You couldn't actually buy anything if you were in the experiment IE7. And even though it was only half a percent of our traffic, and when we ran this 50-50, that meant it was a quarter percent of our traffic, that big fat zero in there was enough to drive the whole experiment down. So it's a lesson that, like, you, even if we say we don't want to support this, if we have some weird experimental results, you should go in and slice up the results by browser. And, and this, is, this is a case of testing your implementation. Like, if we wouldn't have A-B tested, we might have just shipped this. We might have just been like, oh, we know this is awesome. Let's do it. Ship it. And then just never found out, because we don't test in IE7. But so the fact that we went through with A-B testing caught this almost as like a different form of QA. And similarly, so we sliced this by browser, and that taught us that. And with the Australia example, we sliced that by region, because we collect the, the region of the user on the AB logs as well. So just breaking up your data in different ways can teach you a lot of really interesting things. OK, one last mechanical failure, and then we'll get into the uh, other ones. So good old HAL 9000 here. So we ran an experiment on our homepage, a really small percentage, just on like 1% of our homepage. All the metrics just went, went down the drain. Like just like everything was down, time on page, purchases, everything. We're like, how can it be so bad? Like, we just thought this was like a really great experiment. We're like, what is happening? Turns out we have a bot that reloads our homepage every 60 seconds and to tell us how long it took to load and to like ping people if the site goes down. And it got the one in a hundred chance of being put into our AB experiment. And it just kept hitting the homepage. And then it kept not buying anything, bouncing, <laughs> like, <laughs> and so it was pretty embarrassing. We look at the results, we're like, everything is down 10, like, wow, we suck. But it was just like one user really heavily hitting the site, and it wasn't actually a human being. So, so we had to go back and edit our A-B tooling to ignore our bots. But the interesting part about that is, even if it didn't get into the 1%, if it was in the 99%, we would have thought we were awesome. Because we're like, wow, the control sucks so bad. The experiment's killing it. But it, was, it would have been him dragging the control down. So we have actually quite a few bots now that run on our site. Um, another funny Etsy anecdote that I like to tell about this is, we have this feature that's uh, trending search terms. And like, once something gets in there, it kind of like, keeps trending, right? Because people see the link of trending search terms, and then they click it. And that's like a self-fulfilling prophecy of that term being a trending search term. We have a bot that checks if our search is up by searching for owls. And so it searches for owls like every 60 seconds like this bot does. And then so that gets owls in the trending search term. And then like, everybody keeps searching for owls. So we're like, wow, we're like really, <laughs> it's just like a funny thing one day when we realized that, like, why does everybody like owls? Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess we were, yeah, ship, yeah. So yeah, bots do weird things when you let them loose on your site. <laughs> okay, so detecting product issues. This is, this is the, to me, this is why you A-B test. The other stuff's interesting. You can find broken things. You can learn really interesting things about your site. But the power of this is that our intuition is very, very often wrong, and we're really bad. Even like one of those things where you, you know, you tell like, Estimates are always off by a magnitude of 50%. So you're like, well, I'm going to double all my estimates. And then you're still off by 50%. It's like the same thing where you're like, I know my intuition's bad, so I should like, think harder about it and do research. And then like, your intuition's still bad a lot of times. It's really hard. So the power of A-B testing is really getting uh, like a real look into how users interact with your feature before you just ship it to your whole site. And you can actually tell if it's working, if people are using it, if it's all kinds of stuff. So my favorite story to tell about this, and this is sort of a platitude inside of Etsy now at this point. This is like the most famous case of A-B testing for us, is the uh, infinite scroll. Um, everybody was doing it a couple years back. The idea is here, you know, you keep scrolling, things keep happening. That's the WOA. You know, you just keep scrolling, you get a million items. And we were just so convinced we had to have it. All the other sites were doing it. It was so cool. It was, you know, it was the hip thing. So it was one of those things where it almost just became, it was like a, it was like fate, like we had to do it, right? Everybody else is doing it, we're gonna have to do it, all our users are asking for it. And so we just, we didn't think to test the thing. So we were just like, we're gonna build it, and then we're just gonna like, we'll A-B test it at the end to just prove it's awesome, and then we'll ship it. 
So this is a slide from uh, old coworkers, uh, Dan McKinley's talk. You should really go, to, if you're interested in this, check out his talk. We're going to build it. We're going to fix some bugs. We'll A-B test it to measure the obvious improvement, rent a warehouse, hold a party in the warehouse. Like that, <laughs> that was the infinite scroll implied release plan. Um, you know, because we just knew it was going to be awesome. And like, it's so easy to do this with any feature. You're just like, it, it's going to be great. And so the problem is here, the first three things are lots of work, and then we never got to have the party because step three didn't work. So we spent months, like we literally spent like two developers, a designer, a project manager, spent a whole summer building Infinite Scroll before we ever got to the A-B testing part. And then we're like, oh, it doesn't work. If a purchase were down by over 20% with this thing. And it was pretty brutal. And so we're like, well, just got to shut it off. And we didn't have anything to pin it on because we spent all this time developing and then we had nothing to point our finger at. Like, what was it? Do people really not like seeing more listings on a page? Is it because the back listing, you know, pushing back doesn't work anymore when you open a listing, it kind of sucks? You know, there's just all of these things because we ship mountains of code at once. And what we could have done in one afternoon, we could have tested our theory. Are more items on a search result page better? Could have written one little block of code. If you're in the experiment, show 80. If you're in the control, show 40. Run the test. We did it, actually, after we learned this lesson the hard way. People didn't buy more things. They actually liked having 40 items on a page instead of 80 better. So we could have just stopped right there. We could have just saved like months of work. We just, so the lesson here is you really got to test your ideas in isolation. If you have this theory and you think more items on a search result page is going to be better and people are going to love it, well, don't build the whole thing. Just show a couple visitors, to, you know, a small percentage of people to your site. Just show them 80 instead of 40. And if they don't like it, well, now you have some explaining to do for why you still think they're going to like Infinite Scroll better, even though they didn't like the 80. And then one other one, this is, this is another case of A-B testing telling us something that our intuition was very wrong about. So we thought, why do we hide passwords by default on mobile? Um, you know, usually people aren't looking over your shoulder when you're typing your password, so let's by default show it to them and then have a little checkbox there that says hide your password. So if you're on stage at a conference, you can push hide if you really need to. And then, but otherwise, you know, we're show by default. And we're like, this is going to be great, right? People are going to log in more. They will mistype their passwords less. We'll have less people like emailing support saying, I can't log in, you know, whatever. Seemed like a simple, obvious win. We hacked it up, shipped it, logins tanked. And we're like, okay, well, why is nobody logging in? And we couldn't figure it out. We were scratching our heads. We were scratching our heads. But it turns out the employees of Etsy, we have a password policy and we all have really good passwords. Our users don't. Their password's something like orange with the G and the R switched. Um, but when you type orange with the G and the R switched into that password box, it auto-corrects it to orange. And then you try to sign in, and you don't get in. And so and we just thought it was an obvious improvement because we all had really good passwords. So when everybody, all the staff members tested this, we just thought it was sweet. But it turns out that like, your users aren't you. Like, they're a very different group of people. They have a very different experience with your product. And it just... We would have not learned that had we not run this. And this allowed us to catch our mistake early and sort of figure that out. So it turns out you can actually disable auto-correct. And we tried that. And it worked better, but and it ended up being a no-go. Um, just for closure on this story, um, you shouldn't do this, because it turns out you can't stop the browser from remembering that, um, because browsers explicitly don't remember password fields, but they do try to remember those. So we had to shut that off for security concerns. But it did work better for a little while. So I mean, this is just about A-B tests telling you about unintended consequences. Because the world is a really, really complex place. The designer who thought of this didn't realize that autocorrect was going to happen because they just were thinking about other things. And there's just a million things that can affect every feature on your site, the way everything interacts. And it's just a way of keeping you honest by seeing what actually happens when you ship this to a small percent of your users. All right. Last little bit here. This is, this is the, uh, my, my little screed. So, you can't measure everything that matters. Like A-B testing is a, a, just a tool in your toolbox. Like you have to, you can iron out all these mechanical issues that we talked about first. You can run these little tightly scoped tests, you know, to make sure you don't build an infinite scroll instead of when you know it's not going to work. But you really, there's, there's these things that you can't measure, um, especially with just like a computer. I mean, you might be able to ask people about it, but sometimes people, like you were talking about, like don't even know what makes them happy. So. Let's just a little thought experiment. If out in the hallway after this for the rest of the day at the conference, you flip the coin in your head or you have a way right, to do a 50-50 A-B experiment, and the experiment is you ask everybody you meet for a dollar. So I'm out in the hallway, like, oh, hey, new guy. Oh, whoop, got tails. OK, got a dollar. Can I have it? Like, you just do that for the rest of the day, and you're going to get home, and you're going to analyze your A-B test results. Oh, man, I got like six more bucks today than I got yesterday. And like, 
yeah, but what you can't measure there is now there's like 30 people that think you're a really weird dude. And like, <laughs> so there's this thing where it's like, yes, you have more money and that's what you can measure, but you can't measure the goodwill of the fact that like everybody thinks you're kind of weird now. <laughs> and so that's what you're doing with this. Like someone's showing up at your website, and you're like, hey, can I have a dollar? Like, give me your email. I'm like, well, no. But if you A-B test it, you're gonna have more emails. And you probably even have more time on your page because people are trying to figure out how to close this stupid thing. <laughs> and like, but what you can't measure here is the goodwill, the brand impression, the happiness of people on your site. Like, that's, that's this like, eph ephemeral thing. But the things that you can measure are gonna go up. So you have to be really careful about just being like, A-B testing is this silver bullet because, yeah, this would seem great if you just looked at the metrics dashboard in your A-B testing tool. But I would hate it. Don't make me put it on your site. All right, that's my talk. I think I got like two minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask me anything, otherwise I'll be around the hallway all afternoon.